Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm uh, talking um, about geospatial analysis, and the second thing you see, the title is Jupiter Hub. Um, Any one of you already used Jupiter Hub before? Oh, cool. So not too many, but more and more and more. That's great. <laughs> um, actually, I could have titled the uh, talk Jupiter Lab with Jupiter Lab instead of Jupiter Hub, but I, I want to show you how cool Jupiter Hub is. It's basically Jupiter Lab where you can log in. So if you go on a website and you have a Jupiter Hub installed, you just get this page here, and you can sign in. And after signing in, you see this. So <laughs> it's perfect. So it's a multi-user um, Jupyter Lab, and that's pretty much all. Um, there is something I, I like to show you too. This one you can do with a no regular Jupyter um, notebook or Jupyter Lab installation too. You see, I have three kernels here. I have a, a Python kernel, I have a Markdown kernel, I have an R kernel. But there is another feature, you can have kernels with different Python versions, and that's quite handy. And um, you just create a virtual environment. You see that above, We're using Conda in our case. And um, environment name, whatever you like, and then you specify Python 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, whatever. Don't use two. And the IPython kernel. And then you activate this uh, environment and install all your cool packages you want to use. And after that, um, you can create a new kernel with the line above. Just IPy kernel, install, user space, and name of the new kernel. And the screen turns black. <laughs> um, and then you can list all the kernels using Jupyter kernels backlist, and you see actually all the kernels installed. So if you make this procedure for, let me say, five different um, Python versions, you will see actually five different Python versions in your Jupyter lab environment. And that's really quite handy. And if, and now we come back to the original title, Geospatial, if you install geospatial modules, then you usually have to install many uh, C-based libraries. And for that, it's really, really recommended to have uh, multiple um, Python versions and environment. And um, of course, if you are on Jupyter Hub, you will have your file system there, and you can access all your um, user files from the Jupyter Lab or Hub. So what we are doing, we have a HP Apollo 6500 server, and on this server we uh, installed Jupyter Hub, and we bought this machine um, with 48 cores, 192 gigs of RAM, and attached it to our small um, storage system with 120 terabytes, um, which is actually quite fast storage, where we have one GB per second um, reading and writing speed. And that's also a very important fact. If you have terabytes of geodata, you want to have a, a really fast and reliable system. We also have Ford and Vita Tesla V100 in it. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's high tech here. <laughs> so I think the cable should be changed uh, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what I wanted to say, we have uh, NVIDIA Tesla V100, the SXM2 model, that's here, one of them, and um, uses uh, lots of power and, and uh, has 900 GB bandwidth, so it's quite fast. That we use to create our deep learning models, um, more about that maybe later. So um, what is geodata? There are some standards, ISO standards, describing what's geodata, the Technical Commission 211 series, um, and so on. But the most important is most data you have uh, has a geospatial component. Uh, most data you actually have has a location component, or you can create a location component out of it. And um, mostly um, people use GIS software to load and manage this data. However, that's um, something I do not want to do personally. I use Python for that. 
So what I show you now is everything I'm doing with geodata is done in a Jupyter notebook, and um, you can really um, uninstall all JS software if you if you do that. And today I'm um, limiting myself to to um, vector data and a little bit raster data. There is also um, other geospatial data like point clouds and 3D objects, and that's not what I'm going to tell you. So um, everything is open source I'm showing today. Um, the most important two libraries are C++ based. It's GDAL OGR. Okay. And the second library is Geos. And um, they, are, they have bindings in Python, and it's really, um, uh, it's not Pythonic. So therefore, some people created new Python modules, which are really Pythonic, and, and use the same C++ uh, library, and it's much, much nicer to, to work with that. I would not recommend using GDAL directory. I would use um, Rasterio for Raster data processing, Fiona for vector processing, and Shapely to do some vector data operations. I will show you in an instant. And um, if you know Pandas, a uh, really nice uh, module in Python, there is also GeoPandas, which extends Pandas for geospatial data. So that's, I, I give you the links which projects we are looking at today. Um, the most important is that we use Jupyter Notebook and the first module I'm showing you is Folium. Folium is basically leaflet.js, JavaScript library, to create maps. It's one of many um, um, JavaScript libraries to create maps. And with three lines of code, you have a map in your Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. So you can specify um, the import a volume module and you just create a map, you specify a location and a zoom level. The zoom level is um, how far you are away from the ground. There are you typically about 20 zoom levels. You know that from other mapping services like Google Maps, Bing Maps, OpenStreetMap, Yahoo Maps, and all these map services that exist today. Another thing is, if you look at vector data, um, there are some specifications, like the OGC simple feature access specifications, where geodata, and, and in this case, vector data, is defined. Um, this is used in many databases, like PostGIS, PostgreSQL, and so on. And um, uh, one of many representations is just using text. So I use text to specify a point, I use text to specify a polygon, and so on. The reason for that is um, you can print it, and in 100 years you can still read it. <laughs> so in the Chico world, that's a very important topic. There is also the um, WKB, a binary format, but I'm not talking about that now. So here are some examples. If you specify a point in WKT, well-known text, it's just point, brackets 10, 20 in this example, or if you have um, polygon, it would be polygon, text for the coordinates, or there are some things like multi-polygons, so you have multiple polygons, for example, if you have a country with islands, there are multiple polygons in that, there are also countries with holes, and then you have a hole, this is all specified in a WKT, so it's a, it's, it's a nice thing, and we can use that directly, with Shapely, we can use that directly. So we can uh, create something similar like, like the WKT, just using um, a Python um, list and tuples for the coordinates. And you see you create, you, you import polygon, import point, and here you just specify your polygon. And if you look at it, you see the first and the last point is the same. That's an important aspect of this standard. The first and the last point is the same, so we have a closed polygon. Um, we can actually load it from text too. We can uh, create a string with, with the WKT definition and load this using Shapely WKT and just load S, S for string, and then we have our polygon definition. Another format which is pr uh, quite popular in the JavaScript world is GeoJSON. 
and uh, there you also um, uh, create your polygons and and specify the coordinates. That's um, another approach to um, define vector data. Of course, there are many other formats too. I'm not going into details there now, but that's what you find if you go into the geo business. So let's let's um, just add such a geojson in Folium. You see, it's a little bit more complicated, but basically, you open the geojson file, you load it, and you put it on the map. Again, same syntax, and then you use the geojson from Folium. It's just called geojson, and you add it to your map. In this case, I loaded a geojson of Switzerland. Okay, you see that it's a it's the shape of Switzerland. And now I do the same again, but I um, plot it directly using uh, Shapely, and you see there is a, it's not, it's not the same, so there is a distortion. So Switzerland is not that distorted, distorted usually. Um, and the reason for that is we have different coordinate systems. So um, yeah, let me show you <laughs> um, the graticule on the sphere. You know that there is longitude, latitude, Longitude along the equator, latitude to the, for the poles, and um, you can project this to to a map. Um, the easiest way is just to create um, out of the uh, sphere. You just create a Cartesian coordinate system. So you do map the latitude, longitude on it, and then you get this one, and that's um, a completely distorted image of the world. Uh, it's not what you see in Google Maps, actually. Um, there is even more bad with more distortions. So um, there are some definitions. Um, the Earth is an ellipsoid, so um, the World Geodetic System 1984 defined some, some um, uh, data of how the, the Earth is best fit in a, in a, a rotational ellipsoid or spheroid. And out of that, you can create different map projections. I, I took three here out of many 10,000 different. Actually, you could invent your own map projection if you want to. And here I, I printed three of them. And you see they are all a little bit different. Um, the Mercator projection is what you know from Google Maps, etc. And you see um, uh, the Antarctis down here. Uh, is bigger than most other continents, which is completely wrong, but it's an effect of projections. So um, we can look at these so-called coordinate reference systems or spatial reference systems, and we, we can uh, uh, have two uh, special cases. One is we use geocentric Cartesian system, that's just Cartesian system with X, Y, Z, or we use projected coordinates that's usually um, not 3D, it's actually flat. And that's um, the, actually every country has its own representation. Uh, Switzerland has its Swiss grid, and, and for example, also countries that have their um, um, special coordinate systems too. I'm not going into details here, um, but you can look it up at epsg.io, you can look the system of your country. Uh, EPSG is the European Petroleum Survey Group. They catalog all these, these coordinate systems. And for example, the EPSG 4326 is the World Geodetic System 1984. Okay, that was a little bit off topic. Let's look at the real example. We are located around here. Oh, we are located around here. So um, we, we can have, say we have a longitude of 7.5. So here, Greenwich um, is zero, and we are seven degrees um, to the east, and then 47 is, is, the, is the latitude. So um, here would be the equator, so we go 47 up, oh, it's here, yeah, and we are in Switzerland at the Congress Center Basel. So that's how it works, maybe. <laughs> the problem we will see in an instant. So um, with Shapely, we can do some nice expressions. We can, we can um, check if a point is inside a polygon, for example. That's a very complex operation, but with Shapely, it's just a few lines of code, actually one line of code. 
So you create a point, 47.7, that's our coordinate of the Congress Center Basel. You, I can look at it as WKT, WKT um, representation, I see point and the coordinate, so everything is perfect. And then I um, check the operation. This Europeisen point is within Switzerland, and we get the result false. So what did I do wrong? <laughs> lowercase. Lower, ah, lowercase, wrong projection, it's all wrong. So <laughs> no, it, it's, it's very simple. It's very simple. You see, um, I, I show you the result, how it is done correctly. So what was, it, what was the difference? I flipped the latitude, longitude, now I have the longitude first, and then it works. So uh, <laughs> the problem is, um, before we had the volume module, volume says first latitude, then longitude, shapely says first, first longitude, then latitude. And that's, that's, a <laughs> that's a common um, problem. Some people say lat long, long lat, lat long, this is best, or no, that, that is better and the confusion is perfect. So we have to always consider that and know which module uses which representation. Personally, I, I um, prefer this approach too because it's something like x axis first and y axis second, but in geographic coordinates you can't say x axis and y axis, so that's the point of where many people find it's worth disputing. So I said before we have other vector formats. I'm not going into the details. I just recommend if you want to read vector data, use the Fiona module. But as the time is going on, I'm, I'm showing quickly GeoPandas, which is um, uh, pandas with the ability to make some geographic or geospatial queries. So I can load something. Um, let me load a data set with the all cities of the world with more than 5,000 with a population greater than 5,000. You can download this data set at geonames.org. Um, so it's very small, so you don't see that good well because it has many um, data in it. So I reduced it to the most important data. So I take the name, latitude, longitude, population. Now you see I take latitude first and longitude. And um, that's the data set. You can create a geopandas out of it. Um, the trick is you make a column with name geometry, and in this geometry, you have a shapely representation of, of the geographic information. This could be a point, like in this case, or a polygon, a multi-polygon, or whatever. You can create your, your geometry column just there. So geopandas can also plot, like we know that from pandas. Just make your geodata frame, and you plot it, and if you plot all cities of the world, you see, um, you recognize the shape of the continents, more or less. Um, so uh, Europe is quite green in this case, so there are many cities. So I can do some queries. I can, it's basically panda, so <laughs> same. And uh, you see, if I make a query uh, name Basel, I get Basel information. But more interesting are spatial queries. So. Let me get um, the distance from the Congress Center here to all other cities in this data set. So I just create our point again and calculate the distance and um, make a new column um, with distance and I sort this column distance. So the, I'll show you the result, it's simpler to understand. So you have the name here and the the geometry and here the distance. So you see we have Biersfelden is just next to Basel and Basel itself. So it's a little bit strange because it's also always the center. So it's the distance to the coordinates. So we are closer to Biersfelden than to Basel. Binningen, Weil am Rhein, that's in Germany. Saint Louis, France, and so on. So that's the, the names of, of these eras in, with the distance. So I can also um, query within a polygon. So I can use my polygon again and say I would like to have all the cities within the polygon Switzerland. And then we see um, if I do that and, and combine it with something else, like for example, I, make, I would have, like to have all the, the cities with a population bigger than 
then 20,000, and I return, this is not sorted actually, but it doesn't matter, so I get um, all the cities in this data set within Switzerland and um, with a population greater than 20,000. So let's um, do one more thing, display the cities in a volume map. That's quite easy, you can combine those, those modules, so you just create, um, with apply for example, you can specify a function which fills the, creates marker of every city, and then you have that in volume. So um, let me do a last example before <laughs> the session chair throws me out. <laughs> Um, there is, for example, um, a nice data set for, with um, live earthquakes or um, the earthquakes of the last two weeks. So you can download that directly with this, um, with this link. I do that, for example, with the requests uh, module and then I store it as a file, earthquakes, um, geojson. I just did it half an hour ago about and um, that was the result. So I can use GeoPandas to open my GeoJSON directly and display the first five um, incidents. And again, I simplify the data set. I reduce it to, um, to four columns, time, magnitude, place, and geometry. We see the first five, it's not sorted anyway. And um, yeah, we see a trend in California at the moment. There is a hotspot there at the moment. And we can create a histogram out of the data. That's a nice way. Using histograms with 16 bins in this case, we see most, luckily most earthquakes are so around um, three. And there are higher ones in there, unfortunately. And we can, uh, you see in the, in the first column here, you have a timestamp. And to, um, to change this timestamp to a to a better readable um, representation. You can use the daytime and the time zone module of Python and create a new column which, which is more readable. So we have um, 10 of July, um, this is UTC time zone. Um, maybe we hear something about time zones in a lightning talk, I don't know. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, okay. A very nice talk about time zones, very important. Uh, Miroslav, Miroslav. So um, we can plot this, and we can also plot multiple geodata sets. Uh, and uh, you see, I read this geodata frame, and I can combine this using just plots, multiple plots, using the axis. You can have multiple plots, so I can display the continents and some earthquake on it. You could uh, do more. You could change the size of the, of the dots, um, depending the magnitude, um, and I think the cable says it's time <laughs> for questions. So um, thank you very much for your attention. And are there any? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, that's... Actually, there is a microphone on the table, I think, somewhere. I d I'm not quite sure. Hello? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, can you say something about what you use this very expensive computer for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I unfortunately wanted to say more about that, but I was running out of time after... Um, 35 slides, I said, oh, I have to stop slowly. Uh, we do some project, um, uh, for example, to detect solar panels on the roofs. We have the uh, data set of orthophotos of total Switzerland. That's about two terabyte of data. And there we try to detect um, solar panels, different kind of solar panels. And um, therefore, we create um, uh, models, deep learning models, and train that. And for training, we use the four GPUs and to improve it. Oh, there, <laughs> it's confusing with the microphone. <laughs> okay, and of course, many other applications. We, we do many um, deep learning projects at the moment.
No, I didn't. I didn't skip. I, I actually didn't even put inside in this presentation. I mean, that we have, we have five minutes. Yeah, but I don't have it ready actually to. Um, okay. Are there any solutions for geo geodata spatial queries in databases in Django applications you would recommend? Because we've seen Python now, but if I have to trim it down to SQL, it becomes a bit more complex, especially when I have to do it from a Django. Direction. Yeah, of course you can. You can. This is something I don't. Un, I don't like to answer in a Python conference, but I, uh, you ask me now. So, <laughs> uh, for example, as PostgreSQL and PostJS, and PostJS um, uses spatial queries too. You can do the same, like I showed here, and unfortunately, you can do that with Post PostJS much faster than using um, the Jupyter. Lab solution I showed you. So what I showed you is actually slower than if you are using Postgres. So, but you can you can do actually the same. The disadvantage, of course, is you don't have a nice Python environment. You can't program it nicely like this. You can just do queries. Yeah, I'm aware of that, but uh, it's it's a feature of a specific database, and and if I want to do it from Django, Django yeah. and and the Django query should also work with SQLite, then I think. I, there is, I can't there is, just use the, uh, the do, Postgres Are you aware features? of the project GeoJungle? There is a GeoJungle okay. which takes, uh, takes care of these details. So you can directly access the, the features of, of PostJS with GeoJungle. some possibilities to use uh, mm, this, uh, these libraries for uh, the planets other than Earth, so Mars or... Yes, or it's actually no problem. You can, you can do any planet. Um, uh, the only problem is that you don't have high resolution data of, of other planets, but it's basically the same. You just need the model. Um, there are models for, for Mars, for example. There are models for most um, near planets. Uh, on Earth, you have the WGS84 uh, representation, but the Mars is basically also an ellipsoid, so you can do exactly the same calculations. With, with, you could even do distance calculations from one point to the other with GeoPandas and the Mars dataset, so it's no problem. OK, thanks. Yes, I will make them. I think all your Python slides will be on the program, on the website program. So all speakers will upload them, and and you can just download it from the from the place where where the schedule is. So it just click on the on the on the topic, and you will get the link to the to the slides. That's a very good question. Um, um, don't use GeoPandas for very large data sets. If you, <laughs> if you, it, it's the same like Pandas. You can't use Pandas for very large data sets at the moment. Uh, the developers are working on that. They try to, to do some memory voodoo. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, but it, it will not work um, unless you use um, modules. I didn't show that because it's already too much in the detail. If you use Fiona, for example, you can take one, um, actually one uh, row of, of the data set, uh, and you have that in the memory. So you, you, do, you have to do the memory management yourself. For, for example, if you want to do some distance calculations, you would just do it on a per row base. And then you could take a multi-terabyte data set and do your calculations with that. There is also, for larger data sets, there is PySpark and GeoPySpark. <laughs> See, there is a trend in putting a Geo in front of uh, classic Python modules. And with GeoPySpark or PySpark, you can do much bigger calculations. How many points, how much gigabytes did you load at once? Um, actually, there is, there is almost no limit. It's it's a hardware it's it's a hardware issue. If you have enough money for the hardware, you you can you can have unlimited amounts of data. 
Okay, thank you very much again.